Welcome to the Cocky Ride Home for Monday, March 21st, 2022. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, how to appear effortlessly charming to new people that you meet. Plus, using squid technology to protect humans from the sun. And a new generation of search apps that search everything you touch on your devices. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. Whether it's returning to the office or getting back into a more regular social life, a lot of us have found ourselves having to relearn conversational norms here and there after so many months predominantly interacting via screens. Or maybe you moved somewhere new, started at a new job or a new school, and are hoping to make a good first impression. Whatever the reason, the BBC recently shared some tips on how to come off as effortlessly charming. Now, some of this will be stuff that you've heard before, but it does seriously seem like the most of us have gotten a bit more awkward throughout the pandemic, so I figured it wouldn't hurt to air a refresher. And while the explanation for how the kinds of people who just seem to charm the pants off of everyone in a room is often just natural appeal, it turns out there is also quite a bit of science to it as well. A psychology study out of Princeton back in 2006 showed that people can make judgments about another person's trustworthiness, competence, and likability after seeing their face for less than a tenth of a second. Now, I'm not saying they make the correct judgments, but that's how quickly people are forming an opinion about you without even super consciously realizing it. The lead author of that study, Alexander Todorov, says that a strong basis of those judgments, as well as a basis for determining attraction, is facial expressions. Our innate judgment of facial expressions is so strong that studies have used facial characteristics to predict the outcome of elections in Bulgaria, France, Mexico, and even the U.S. Senate. Now, this isn't necessarily about having a broadly appealing-looking face. It's more about how you control your facial expressions. Quoting the BBC, Todorov has used data-driven statistical models to build algorithms that can manipulate faces to look more or less trustworthy, allowing him to tease out the features that we trust the most. According to his work, as a face becomes happier, it also becomes more trustworthy. People will perceive a smiling face as more trustworthy, warmer, and sociable, explains Todorov. One of the major inputs to these impressions is emotional expression. If you look at our models and manipulate the faces to become more trustworthy or extroverted, you see the emotional expression emerge, the face becomes happy, end quote. So I guess if you are looking to be perceived as trustworthy, make sure you smile a lot. But I I would say probably be careful not to overdo it to the point of looking creepy. Here's some good news, though. Todorov says that a particularly strong and positive impression with someone a little later on can override a perhaps lackluster first impression. Someone might even forget their negative or neutral snap judgment if you manage to impress them or otherwise show your worth behind initial appearance later. So if you want to get beyond that snap judgment, it's time to turn on the charm. And if you're not one of those naturally charming people, the BBC talked to some experts to get some tips on how to become one, at least whenever you want to turn it on. Jack Schaefer is a psychologist, likability coach, and retired FBI special agent. He told the BBC, quote, Our brains are always surveying the environment for friend or foe signals. The three major things we do when we approach somebody that signal we're not a threat are an eyebrow flash, a quick up and down movement of the eyebrow that lasts about a sixth of a second, a slight head tilt, and a smile. End quote. Now the next tip is one you may have been able to guess. Ask the other person about themselves. Don't just talk about yourself. Find out about their interests and display genuine interest back, and people can tell when you're faking it. Although, your fake will be harder to tell if you maintain deep eye contact. Olivia Fox Cobain, the author of The Charisma Myth, told the BBC that you should focus on the colors of the irises in the other person's eyes, just as a trick to get you to continue making that eye contact. But, you know, I would say if you can just actually be interested in the other person, that's all the better. Keep asking questions and don't be afraid of slight pauses. Sometimes the other person will fill that by going a little bit deeper about what they were talking about. And if you know the person at all already, you can ask more specific questions about their work or interests. You know, if you can set themselves up to feel good about themselves, that is even better. Like maybe you heard they recently got a promotion at work. Congratulate them and ask to hear more about it. And once you've gotten some info from them, respond by finding common ground. 
Schaefer has three tiers of strategy here. Contemporaneously, something you both actually do have in common, like maybe being from the same state. Temporally, maybe you are visiting that state that they're from later in the year. And vicariously, maybe you know someone that is doing something interesting in that state. Now, try not to get to the point of being a competitive conversationalist where you're one-upping everything that they're saying, but showing that you have a vested interest in something about them can help keep the conversation going. And Cobain also adds that it's good to keep up with current events and, for networking purposes, industry news, because those are easy topics to bring up. And another tip that she throws out there, if you do happen to disagree with the person that you're talking to, make an effort to really listen to what they're saying. Really hear them, instead of mentally preparing your rebuttal. And push yourself to still find common ground from which to respond. And finally, another one that you have perhaps heard of before, mirror their body language. This is something that often happens naturally if two people are really hitting it off. In fact, if you alter your position slightly and notice that the other person follows your movement, that could be a good sign. Now, if you want this person to remember you and not just charm them in the moment, you do need to share a little bit about yourself. But even at a networking event, you don't want to unload it all at once. That can totally overwhelm the other person and they won't remember most of it and you might come across as too eager. Schaefer suggests what he calls the Hansel and Gretel technique. Sprinkle breadcrumbs about yourself little by little throughout the conversation. He says that small details can act as curiosity hooks to keep the other person interested. And sometimes even just physically being around someone long enough can make them start to like you. But I will add a huge caveat over all of this, which is that you've got to be watching for the other person's cues. If they aren't interested in talking to you, don't push it. You know, these are tips for when something already seems to be going well. You're not going to suddenly charm someone who has already decided, as is 100% their right, that they are not interested. Just let them have their space and move on. But with any luck, we will all start emerging into these pandemic social situations as the total charmer that everyone wants to be friends with, or at least maybe as the one who helps everyone else feel a little less awkward than they did before. Squids and other cephalopods have a number of mechanisms that can help them camouflage and blend in with their environments. One particular pigment that helps squids in particular change color is xanthomatin. Layla Daravi, an assistant professor of chemistry and chemical biology at Northeastern University, has studied xanthomatin at length and even figured out how to manipulate it to change colors of other things, with the hopes of creating some type of application in clothing or other consumer products, integrating the xanthomatin into materials that would change colors for various reasons. But the study took a sharp turn when a sample was left out on a lab bench, exposed to ambient light, and it changed colors just from that. Duravi explains in Northeastern that that wasn't the result she was looking for, but Dan Wilson, a research scientist on the team, had an idea. If it changed color in the sun, could it be turned into a reliable way for people to know when they've been exposed to too much UV light? And so, building on his grad school work with paper-based microfluidics, Wilson developed a dime-sized device that's basically a sticker a person can wear when outside. Since, as he says, we all know that too much UV radiation is bad, but we can't always translate that into the amount of time we've spent outside. With the sticker, you could get a solid indication of when it's time to go back indoors or reapply sunscreen. Quoting Northeastern News, the wearable device is about the size of the tip of one of Wilson's fingers. It's made of five thin layers of carefully crafted sheets of plastic and a round piece of paper that's been treated with the pigment and dried out. The sensor is activated when a user presses on the button, a small reservoir of fluid in the edge of the device. That pressure pushes the fluid through the channels cut into a middle layer of plastic in order to hydrate the treated paper. Once it's wet, it will react under UV radiation, changing from a yellow-orange color to a red the more it's been exposed. The plastic itself is mostly made of the same material used for a transparent sheet for an overhead projector. There's a simple base layer, then the channel layer, topped with a layer to seal off all the channels, except for a small hole at the middle of which the fluid flows. 
The fourth layer is a spacer, with a wide hole cut into it, into which Wilson carefully places the paper sensor using long, thin tweezers. The sensor layer is topped with a thin film of plastic typically used in the walls or roof of a greenhouse. Wilson selected this material because it lets through as much sunlight as possible." End quote. And if you're already wearing sunscreen, you can put that same sunscreen on the sticker so that it accurately accounts for the protective measure you took. That's something Wilson has specifically tested. He also has another idea for how these sensors can be used that's particularly relevant these days. When using UV light to sanitize a space or object, the sticker could indicate that it's been fully sterilized. Now, no word yet on any tangible plans to get this device to market, but if you're okay with a device that is not inspired by squids, there are a number of UV sensing devices already available. There are wristbands, bracelets, papers. L'Oreal even debuted a fingernail art sensor connected to an app four years ago, although I wasn't able to find more recent information on purchasing one. And it's cool to see devices like this become more advanced and common because Wilson is right. Sometimes it can be really tough to tell when you've already had too much sun exposure, and usually by then, it's too late. You can search the internet, you can search the files on your hard drive, you can search your email and your texts and the various cloud apps you might use, but you can't search all of those things at the same time. At least, not until recently. There's a new generation of tools that's been getting more popular that all aim to do just that, or close to it. And as someone who works across Google Docs, Notion, Slack, Dropbox, Word, Adobe, and more every single day, the concept of a one-stop shop search app sounds like efficiency heaven. Now, full disclosure, I haven't actually pulled the trigger on an app of this sort yet, but Fast Company recently profiled a few of them, and the concept was fascinating enough to me as a sort of shift in how we think about search, research, and personal files and communications that I wanted to share it. So, quoting Fast Company, Mug Sarda, the CEO and co-founder of a universal search tool called Easel, says all of these startups are tapping into a widely understood issue. It's just too hard to get things done across all of your work tools. The space is popular because everyone feels the pain themselves, he says. End quote. Now, Jared Newman, writing in Fast Company, says that he doesn't think any of these apps are all the way there just yet, but I would say it feels like the beginning of an evolution and that we'll probably see a lot of growth and improved UX over the coming months and years, especially as the sector gets even more competitive. So first, there's one called Slapdash, which runs as a desktop app with a Chrome application and lets you search across apps, but its suite of available apps is still limited. No Gmail or Spotify yet, for example. There's a Mac-only one that requires a bit of tech know-how. It's called Raycast, and a big advantage of this one is that it has extensions built by the community. So you get a lot of those creative and specific integrations from real users instead of having to wait for the company to make a decision. Easel, Sarda's app, is a smart browser search, so it doesn't go through any of your desktop applications, but it does make any tools that you use in the browser, like maybe Google Docs, Dropbox, GitHub, etc., way more easily searchable in one go. And on the note of browser search on steroids, I want to add my own recommendation here, which is called Heyday. Heyday is especially marketed towards researchers, which tracks since I did first hear about it through journalist Ryan Broderick's Garbage Day newsletter. Heyday runs through a Chrome extension, which you can connect to apps like Google Drive, Dropbox, Gmail, your Notes app even, etc. And their big selling point is that Heyday will remember every tab you've ever opened, every message you've sent, every search you've ever made. Now, that sounds creepy, of course, but their privacy policy states they'll never sell your data or let someone use it to target ads. It's all encrypted so only you can see it, given that you do have to pay to use Heyday so that they can keep the doors open, but so long as you do trust them, it really does seem worth the money. I mean, how many tabs do you have open right now? What if you could close them and instead get a daily briefing reminding you of what you opened to save for later? What if you could be reminded of articles you half-read and then accidentally closed and forgot where on earth you saw them? And if you search something you've searched before, Heyday will pop up to remind you what you found last time you searched and even give you context with topics from your recent messages if you connect messaging apps. 
I sound like I'm reading a sponsored ad for Heyday, but really, I just think it's super cool, if a little terrifying. Maybe I also just like it because it shares a name with my favorite Kurt Anderson novel. But I'm just really into products that recognize the brain crack nature of using the internet and find ways to make that work better for us. And with almost our entire lives existing on our computers or in the cloud in one form or another, having tools that can quickly search everything all at once really does feel like one of those small tweaks that could be a a total game changer. All right, well, that's going to be it from me for today. But as always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotki.org. I'm Jackson Bird, and I'll talk to you again tomorrow. <laughs>